I'm so happy to have you here with us. Um, Tasha, this is just a small network of friends who just want to learn from people like you um, and then try to apply that to not just for ourselves, but to help others. It's really uh, a pro bono thing that we are trying to just help people and help companies and help to make a better world. So really, really appreciate your time, Tasha. Uh, I know you're about to leave on holiday, so even more important that you make the time now. Thank you for having me. I, I, I love the goal of this and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So let me just quickly, uh, I, I will not read all the bio of Tasha because that would take half of the meeting. Um, I came across Tasha two ways in Thinkers 50 um, and also through Marshall Goldsmith. And I really love what she does um, with it's a mix of psychology and leadership and, and how to become better uh, managers. And I, I love uh, also the, the branding that Tasha brings uh, to the table. I know Tasha, you, you've written two books. You're an industrial organizational psychology uh, PhD. Um, you've advised many clients like uh, T-Mobile, KPMG, so big corporates, IBM, so maybe we can learn a bit about that. You've been named by Thinkers 50, one of the top 30 emerging management thinkers in the world and also coaches uh, with global gurus. So it's just uh, unstoppable this. <laughs> and your TED Talk, obviously, we've all seen and it's really brilliant what you've done in TEDx. Mile Hills, uh, uh, what else can I say? Top uh, bookseller, the New York Times. I want to know how you get there, probably some others too. Um, so just uh, a wonderful career and there's so much to come yet. So I don't know what else are you going to do, but I, I just get amazed with how much you've achieved so far. Um, so let me, we'll, we'll take the time, Natasha, to explore a bit about your experience, your learnings, and then we'll have a just open discussion with the whole group. They will put questions, they will come on camera, and we'll finish on time. Let me start, Tasha, if you don't mind. You want to make a small introduction or I jump on the first question? <laughs> Let me, yeah, I'll, I, I can do a, a, just a quick introduction. I, I think, you know, the, the list is sort of one thing and we can all list our accomplishments. But for me, um, the central theme of um, my life really has been how businesses have the opportunity to transform people and how people transform businesses. Um, and I've learned this from a very young age. Actually, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. My, my grandpa started a plumbing business uh, in Bay City, Michigan, here in the US, uh, right after the war. And then my mom, uh, who was kind of a single mom uh, in the 1980s, really looking at a world and a society that was changing, started the first school here in the United States that trained and certified nannies um, to be placed in the homes of, of you know, dual income couples or single parents. And so I literally got to grow up following her around, watching her be a CEO. And it's really kind of ignited my passion for leadership and for organizational development. And as an adult, um, my career is really to help successful executives win. <laughs> and winning isn't just, you know, revenue and market share. It's, it's also growing themselves, growing the people around them, creating a positive culture and a supportive environment for their employees to work so that they can all thrive. And so for me, you know, done correctly, we've seen this done incorrectly many times, but done correctly, business can be such a powerful tool of personal growth. Um, and that's what I do in my work with, you know, I've worked from everyone with everyone from Salesforce to the NBA to Walmart to the White House Leadership Development Program. And the common theme there is helping success people be even more successful so I just I love the work that I do and, and I love my job even now that I do it remotely I still love it love it <laughs> we can see that from your body language it's, I love when people talk about their passion and their work it's just so evident it's so evident but let me ask you the first question Tasha what did you want to be when you were in high school for example did you want to be what you are now or you had other dreams so it's interesting. I, for a long time, I wanted to be a lawyer, which I feel like is, you know, not the sexiest uh, dream when you're like 
11 or 12. But then I morphed um, once I discovered theater. Um, I That was one of the things I don't talk about as much in, in my sort of professional world now, but I was a um, semi-professional actor when I was younger. I was a theater major. I have my bachelor's degree in theater. Um, but from a self-awareness standpoint, which is the topic of my second book, I, all, I, I loved it, but I knew that I at best I was pretty good. I was a pretty good actor, a pretty good director. Um, I had a lot of friends that were exceptional you know, that studied theater with me and in, in, at university. And so that was one of the forks in the road for me was, you know, when I chose psychology, which was my other major, I never thought that those two things, you know, theater and psychology would come back together in such a fun way, you know, getting to be on stage and share my message through keynotes and speaking. Um, but that was sort of what, where I thought I wanted to go until I, I really found psychology. Um, but the other thing that I think is really lucky is I found organizational psychology pretty, pretty early in my life. I remember the summer of 2001, I had to move to New York City because the tiny liberal arts school um, that I went to for college actually didn't have any organizational psychology classes. So I took this summer class at, um, the, at NYU and, you know, in the first five minutes, I remember just going, oh, this is what I was put on this earth to do. Like, that's helpful to know. <laughs> and so for me, it wasn't really, I did this and then I did that. It was just lucky to kind of find my passion um, really early in life. That's a bit luck when you find your passion so early. And, and how did you, what was that big trans? You wanted to be a lawyer and suddenly you say, no, I want to do something else. What, what was the trigger there? Is it the arts and the, the performance? Uh, what was it? This is crazy. I can actually remember the moment that that happened. I was in, um, it was, you know, probably the early 1990s. I was roller skating around my um, mom's garage, which is something we did you know, at that age and that time. And I found a cassette tape and on it, it said Les Miserables. Oh. And I thought, what's this? And I, I put it in the cassette player and I just my entire life changed when I listened to that cassette tape and I just have this flashbulb memory of it. And I didn't even really know what it was, but I knew that I loved it. Um, and from there, you know, again, pretty early, I got really involved in theater and I did summer stock and, you know, kind of all the things that um, very theatrical adolescents like to do. Um, but it just gave me so much joy and it still does. You know, now I'm a, I'm a patron of the arts and not a performer. Um, and I just love that too. Nice, thank you. Tasha, one question about your speciality, one of them, it's about self-awareness. How do you end up in that niche? How did you end develop in that niche? How did you find it and found it interesting? What, what kind of was research or passion or self-development? What was it? I love the framing of that question because it's really all of the above. Um, Anyone who is on this call today probably has seen examples of self-awareness um, used for good. And then when there's a lack of self-awareness, especially in the business world, how kind of devastating that can be for um, the leader, the person, and the kind of the whole system around them. But what I saw, you know, this was, I started this research and this work probably about seven years ago now. And what I had seen in the executives that I coached was sort of, um, the opposite of what I was seeing in the real world. So in, in my coaching work, and, and again, maybe you guys have seen this too, I, I saw that leaders who were willing to really look at themselves in the mirror and say, you know, who am I? What do I stand for? Um, what's the impact that I want to have on others in the world? And, and how can I really um, sort of humbly and courageously gather and clarify that information? These were people who were astoundingly successful. And it seemed like the more they focused on their self-awareness, the more benefits that gave them, you know, kind of in all areas of their life, not just at work. But then I saw that against a kind of an undercurrent um, and a, a pretty sweeping phenomenon all across the world, um, and I've been lucky to work on every continent but Antarctica, is that we seem to be getting less and less self-aware and more and more self-absorbed as a general rule. And, um, you know, people, I'm, I'm, I joke that I'm the oldest millennial and people joke with me that, oh, it's just you people, you know, you millennials and your self-focus. But there's a lot of evidence that, you know, in, in most countries in the world, in every age group, um, there's sort of an increasing self-absorption. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that and maybe we can talk about that. But what I saw was, you know, 
these people who had sort of figured this out and reaped the, the rewards. And that was what I wanted to do with my research program is, is we got together a team and, and I wanted to answer the questions basically, what is self-awareness really? You know, it's a management buzzword, but what actually is it scientifically? Where does it come from? Why do we need it? And then how can we get more of it? And that kind of led us, you know, and I naively was like, oh, we should be able to do a couple of studies and figure this out. And now, of course, it's seven years later and we're still learning. Um, but it's been a really interesting process for one simple reason. What we've discovered is that a lot of the common wisdom around what it takes to be more self-aware um, is often wrong. And so that, it's no wonder so many of us have so much work to do. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is I am not an expert on high about self-awareness. I'm not just standing there telling everyone else what to do. This has been a learning process for me. And, you know, when I, when I went into this, I thought, oh, who is better to teach everyone about self-awareness than someone like me who is so incredibly self-aware? <laughs> and of course, <laughs> that mirage was shattered very early on. And I continue to be humbled um, and grateful for that new knowledge. So, so we really are all in this together. That's a phrase we've all been saying a lot this year, but I think that's especially true for self-awareness. And Tasha, how do you, you talk about, how do you define self-awareness? And I've seen some figures of your research, which are appalling. Mm -hmm. Can you share a couple <laughs> of them? So we're 50 on the call. How many of us could be self-aware based on your research? Uh, well, yes, let's, let's start there. We'll start with the, the dire situation and then we'll build ourselves back up by okay. learning what it is and how we can do it. So according to our research, um, we found that 95% of people believe that they are self-aware. But unfortunately, only about 10 to 15% of us actually are. <laughs> I'll just let that set in. And for any math nerds on the call, right, um, you know, that means that on a good day, 80% of us are lying to ourselves about whether we're lying to ourselves. So, and again, including wow. me, I was, I was in that category and I think I, you know, I still might be. Um, and, and I think part of the reason it's so difficult to be self-aware, you know, in addition to our, our societal trends, is that there's a lot about the way humans are built that makes it difficult. So again, this isn't an indictment. It's actually one of the most learnable skills out there, in my opinion. Um, but here's what self-aware people are able to clarify. It's really kind of two types of self-knowledge. If the overall definition of self-awareness is, I say, the will and skill to see yourself clearly, it's made up of two distinct types of self-knowledge kind of under that heading. The first is something we named internal self-awareness, which means seeing yourself clearly, knowing who you are, what you value, what makes you tick. Um, but then equally important is something called external self-awareness, which means knowing how other people see us. And what was fascinating early on in this project is, you know, I thought these two, it, once we discovered these two types of self-knowledge, I thought they'd be related. You know, if you were high on one, you'd be more likely to be high on the other. And that is not true. Again, for any math or stats nerds on the call, there is a 0.0, .0 correlation between our internal and external self-awareness. Um, that's interesting sort of scientifically, but what does it mean practically? I think what it means is each of us has to work on both of those skills. We can't assume, for example, that because we're asking ourselves all these really great introspective questions that we're going to know how other people see us and vice versa. Um, so the journey of self-awareness is to build both. And how, well, let me just do a quick check. Can you all raise your hand if you think you're self-aware? <laughs> I am. Well, I think everybody, yeah, we're 100%. <laughs> <laughs> right, perfect. Well, my job is done here then. <laughs> but um, yeah, how can you measure your self-awareness? Or I'm sure you have some tools if you can share a little bit on how does it work? It's a questionnaire or 360 or just how it works. Absolutely. So I'm going to type something into the chat that is a free resource that we created um, with the launch of Insight, um, and I'll kind of talk about what that is, but just so you guys can have the web address. Um, what it was fascinating about measuring people's self-awareness is we saw sort of two distinct patterns. Um, Antonio, you just did the first experiment, which is to ask people in general, do you feel like you see yourself clearly? And that's where 95% of people said, well, yes, of course I do. No one knows me better than me. But then we, we discovered, um, we spent 
almost two years developing an empirically, uh, an, a validated assessment of self-awareness basically, that looked into the seven types of self-knowledge that we discovered self-aware people have um, that other people don't. And they were things, I'll, I'll actually just list them. So self-aware people know their values, what they're passionate about, what they want, their aspirations, kind of what they want to experience and accomplish. Um, they know where they fit in the universe. They know kind of what environments give them energy. They know their patterns of behavior. Um, they know their reactions to situations kind of in real time and their strengths and weaknesses. And then they know the impact that they have on others. And what we discovered was once we found those seven types of self-knowledge, I call them the seven pillars of insight. Once you start to ask people, for example, um, do you have a list of clearly articulated principles that guide how you want to live your life. And that's when people say, oh, well, no, I don't. <laughs> you know, I thought it was self-aware, but now that you ask me really specifically, um, I'm able to make some uh, sort of observations maybe a little bit more accurately. And so um, we found, though, that we are an important source of knowledge about ourselves, but we also have to ask other people how they see us. And that gets back to that internal and external self-awareness. So um, the insight quiz, which I put in the chat, is a, I call it like the party trick version of that longer assessment. The longer assessment is, you know, 70 questions and it has multiple ratings. You fill it out. Lots of people fill it out for you. We're actually still working on making that commercially available. Um, product development is not my strong suit, so it takes a very long time. Um, but hopefully soon that will be out there. Um, but for now, anybody who wants to take this, if you want to give it to your colleagues or your clients, um, it's a free test. It takes five minutes. There's kind of no strings attached other than just to use it to be more self-aware. Um, you'll have somebody who knows you well fill out those questions. It's about 14 questions. Again, it takes five minutes. And then once the system has your results and the person who rated you their results, it'll give you kind of this cool couple of page summary of your internal and external self-awareness. And then a couple of things you can do maybe to to continue to increase both of them. So it's been really popular. Um, we've had, I think, a couple, almost 100,000 people take it. Um, wow. And it's just out there to make the world a more self-aware place. Nice, doing something yeah. great for the world. Thank you, Tasha. I'm going to ask you one more question. I have many, but I'll, I'll pass them to Ron. I see he has put one question. Tasha, for me, more on definitions. Is the same self-awareness that being humble or authentic, or it's all about the same or there's some different connotations? Let me take both of those separately because I think uh, it's a really interesting question. So authenticity and self-awareness, um, I do think they are related, right? If we're not being our authentic self, well, no, if we don't have self-awareness about who we are authentically, we can't behave authentically. So I think they're related. Um, there is a danger sometimes with the term authenticity. I've noticed, you know, sometimes early on, if I'm coaching a, a new executive, they'll say, what? I'm just being myself. And I'll say, well, you are being a jerk <laughs> just now. You know, so, so being authentic isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation with being effective or kind or, you know, so, and I think sometimes that can be a convenient story we tell ourselves, you know, well, I was just being myself. So I do think there's a, there's a tension a little bit that um, self-awareness doesn't equal authenticity because self-awareness is about constantly reassessing, you know, how am I doing? Is this having the effect I'm intending and so on. For humility, we found really consistently that self-aware people on average tend to be significantly more humble. And there's a lot, you know, I know there's people on this call that are experts in humility um, as kind of a, a topic area. But, but what I would offer is humility happens when we understand, you know, A, that we are not the center of the universe, B, what our weaknesses are, and then see how other people can contribute to whatever it is we're doing. And so I think it does take that self-awareness to have those things. And that explains, I think, why they're so related. Does that answer your question? Very you much, know? yes. And very precise. I really like, I like the authenticity. It doesn't lead to self-awareness. I, I really like that. Yeah, you are brilliant explaining. Uh, very concrete and very sharp. Thank you, Tasha. Let me go to one of our friends, Ron Carucci. He has... One uh, very important question. We're a, lit, a lot of us are project leaders, project managers. So I think Ron will talk about that in his question. Um, yeah, so I'm not a project leader, but I play one on TV. Um, <laughs> uh, Tasha, we have to have coffee because we, really we really live parallel careers. We really actually have 
followed each other's career paths in, in such funny ways, including NYU um, and theater. That's crazy. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I, went I to knew Juilliard. the theater. I didn't know the NYU. So it's really, we should have a coffee and, and laugh about that. Anyway, I, so I, I don't, I, I design project-based organizations. That's how I spent a lot of my life. Um, and so I, so project leaders have this unique role of seeing organizations at their best and worst, right? So you've got a bunch of people sitting around you who come with their functional biases. They come with their agendas. They come with a, a mandate from their homeroom leader to say, don't let this happen on the project. And so they're sitting there with this, in this sort of cesspool of conflict with this mandate to, get, to drive this initiative, launch this product, move this along the, the lines. And as a project leader, you're sitting there looking at all of this unspoken, probably even subconscious material. Uh, and you're, you're, you're both advantaged if you can talk about it, and you're completely crippled if you can't. Mm. Uh, because with all that material operating, the project is really dead on arrival. Um, and yet, you, you project leaders disproportionately play an incredible role in being a mirror of the culture because of what they're seeing a cross section of it right around them. So my question is, what can project leaders do in the moment where every functional bias is fighting for its own agenda? Um, people are not speaking up. They're speaking behind the project leader's mouth. They're getting you know stuff in their ears from their homeroom leader about what the project should or shouldn't be. They're getting mixed messages. And they've got to deliver a result. They've got to deliver a product. They've got to deliver a new strategy. They've got to deliver a merger integration. What can they do when they're, how can they become more prepared to be aware of, first of all, their own triggers, mm -hmm. but when they're seeing this transference party all around them, how, what, what can they do to let that stuff become a healthy part of the project and not get in the way of the project? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to that. Um, the first thing I would say, Ron, is I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. So maybe what I'll do is just, <laughs> it's because you, you guys are doing this every day and you know kind of what works. But let me give you a couple of thoughts and maybe we could, I don't know, Antonio, if I'm breaking the rules, but maybe yeah. we could toss it up to the group um, and see what other people have found yeah. to be helpful. So that's great. So I um, worked for about three years. So, so my my sort of biography is I, I spent five years in graduate school. I spent about five years in the Fortune 500 world. And then about 10 years ago or so, I went out on my own kind of doing what I do now. But in that Fortune 500 stint, one of the places I worked was um, a large kind of uh, project delivery firm called CH2M Hill. It was bought by Jacobs. And so now it's part of Jacobs. But one of the fun things that I got to do in my role there, um, I was their, their head of, of global leadership development is I would actually be flown to projects where um, either they were just starting up the project and they wanted it to go well, or <laughs> more often than not, the project was imploding and they needed a psychologist to come in and kind of make everyone talk to each other and get on a better path. And what I discovered and what I know a lot of you already know on the call is the importance of chartering a project. Um, so if, for example, you know, everybody starts working on something, you don't have agreed guidelines for how, you know, you communicate or, you know, ground rules for speaking up if you see an issue or, you know, sort of candid conversations, it becomes a lot more difficult to have those conversations down the line. Um, and so I'm thinking of a, a project, it was like a $1 billion um, uh, oil sands project that was being done between Canada uh, and Argentina. <clears throat> My job was to come in and kind of everybody got together in Buenos Aires. It was a beautiful week um, and really kind of hammer out those agreements before the project started, both with the, the, the project team itself and then also together with the client. And what I found is, you know, investing that couple of days, even, even a couple of hours, even a Zoom call where we say, how are we going to communicate in this project, um, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of intervention. In other words, if we can have those agreements at the beginning, you know, Ron, to your point, um, uh, you know, as the, as the project manager, uh, you guys empowered me to speak out if I'm seeing dysfunctional behavior. And I am now going to make good on that commitment and agreement, right? That's a completely different conversation than like, hey, I'm just going to say something and, and upset everyone. So, so I think that would be my biggest piece of advice. But again, I know you guys all know this a lot better than I do. So um, what have you seen? Well, I think you were spot on, Tasha. We will hire you to manage some of our projects one day. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you were spot on. Let me ask the audience. I know there was one comment from one project management expert. I know, yep, he's in the Netherlands. And he answered to the question, who is self 
and where in the call he said, not anymore. So I want mm. to tie that to, Jeff, can you tell us first, uh, yeah, why no more? And second, what do you think about the point of Ron and Tasha around projects? You are in a world. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Antonio. Um, yeah, I, I like, again, uh, the discussions and uh, the, the different uh, views on uh, how to change the world and how we can change the world. I'm struggling with it for, um, um, I'm working now, I think, for 60 years. I started when I was seven, uh, working at the company with my father during the holidays. Uh, and um, yeah, I ended up as a project manager. I have been one of the key founders of the IPMA certification scheme. I did help uh, Richard Trial with the launch of Prince2 and the dissemination of Prince2. And I just launched um, a new uh, project management standard for small projects. It's been launched earlier this year. In the meantime, I'm now involved in what they call the South African Distance Learning Initiative. They want to connect 9 million uh, students to the internet. Um, I said they are crazy. Um, now, the reason why I changed uh, my mind of uh, being self-aware uh, to uh, self-absorption is that I I just Googled while uh, Tasha was uh, explaining the, and giving the definitions and looking at uh, self-absorption, uh, which was a new term for me. I said, uh, that's me now. Uh, I tried to ignore uh, those who are against or not willing to, to, uh, to, um, to, to work on new initiatives. Um, I myself, I did spend a lot of time in the past um, I think the biggest problem is that, um, and maybe that is the problem with self-absorption. I do try to get a few projects up and running. Um, the stakeholders are um, all can benefit of the initiative, but for some reason they all block the initiative. And I'm not sure what the reason is. Is it because we use the word of let's um, collaborate? Because collaboration means that they have to share the budget with others instead of spending it all themselves. I don't know. Um, we used in the past a an, uh, an, uh, one-liner, you have to repair the roof while the sun is shining. But no company did buy in on the moment that the sun was shining and they started the projects when it was raining. Well, so, so. And I'm still looking after 60 years how to, uh, yeah, how to change, how, how to make change possible in an easy way. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, is there a solution? That's my question. <laughs> I haven't found it yet. Anything you want to comment on that one, Tasha, or I ask feedback to someone else? I, I think it stands on its own. I think that's a phenomenal observation. Thank you for that. Yeah. Let me go to James. He has a question as well. James, where are you calling from, James? I'm just outside London, Antonio. You're still there. I'm still there. Yeah, I haven't moved. We're all locked down, so, you know, <laughs> can't really go anywhere. Hi, Tasha. Um, Tasha, I was really interested to know whether the internal and external self-awareness correlates against um, introversion and extroversion scores. And have, have you correlated and what does that look like? It'd be great mm -hmm. to know. That's a great question, James. Thank you for that. Um, so here's the best way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to the introversion and extroversion, um, but first I wanna talk about how internal and external self-awareness relate to each other, because I think that is a sort of foundational piece. Remember when I said they don't have any relationship with each other. So you can be high on one, low on the other, high on both, low on both, et cetera. Yeah. And so what that allows us to do as psychologists is create, you know, a two by two matrix, which is one of our favorite things in the whole world to do. <laughs> so you can imagine, and obviously it's not this simple, but you can imagine, you know, high on both internal and external self-awareness, low on both, and then high on one and low on the other, right? And there are two, you know, so, so if you're low on both, you're what I call a seeker. And again, there's nowhere to go but up. Um, if we focus and have the courage and commitment to work on our self-awareness, we will improve. Um, if we're high on both, then good on you. You can continue that journey and really there's always more to learn. But if you're high on one and low on the other, that's where I think it starts to get really interesting um, and might be related to introversion and extroversion. So let's say that someone is 
high on internal self-awareness, but low on external self-awareness. So what that means practically is, you know, if I'm, if I'm an introspector, which is what I call that, that category of people, it means that self-examination might be a hobby of mine, right? I, I might love to meditate. I might like to journal or to go to therapy or read self-help books. Um, but what I'm missing is the uh, knowledge of how other people see me, right? So I could have a very sort of adamant, clear picture of how I think I'm impacting other people. But if I'm not getting that information, um, I'm not necessarily going to know for sure. So that's one. So introspectors is more just kind of that self-focus at the expense of other people. But then the opposite is um, what I call a pleaser. And pleasers are people who are so focused on that external piece, on sort of knowing, um, uh, wanting to create a certain uh, uh, kind of, picture of themselves with others or wanting to do what other people want them to. You know, it's the classic student who doesn't want to go pre-med in university, but goes pre-med because their parents want them to, not because they want to. So for pleasers, the journey is really kind of figuring out what do I really want? Um, we've done a little bit of investigation about sort of how those two things are related to introversion and extroversion, and we actually haven't found a very strong relationship. And to me, that's interesting, because what that means is, regardless of my introversion or extroversion, I could be in any of these categories. And the reason I think that is, is self-awareness is more kind of a skill versus introversion and extroversion are hardwired. Um, you know, there's a, a very famous but also very controversial psychologist called Hans Eysenck, if anyone is familiar with his work. Um, but among many other things, he actually found, for example, that um, if, if you ask introverts and extroverts to eat a lemon, just eat a lemon, they will have different physiological reactions to eating that lemon. The introverts will have a more extreme reaction, right? They'll produce more saliva, the lemon is more sour than extroverts um, because extroverts are more kind of sensation seeking. Um, and, and to me, I think that's just an example of where it's almost like apples to oranges when you put those things together. I'm not saying that there isn't a pattern um, and we haven't really kind of gone super, super specifically to try to find one, but in a little bit of initial research, we didn't find any relationship between introversion, extroversion, and internal and external self-awareness. I know that was a long answer, but I hope there's something in there that's interesting and helpful. Thank you so much, that's fascinating. Isn't it? Yeah, thanks. I never heard the story about the lemon. I'm going to try it at home. <laughs> perfect, <laughs> this is a perfect quarantine activity. <laughs> Actually, I have one question myself, and then there is uh, Maria Isabel and uh, Gerardo and Mark with a few more questions. My question, Tasha, You've coached so many people. What are the most impressive people you've coached? I see if you look at your videos, you've been with top, top people. One or two people maybe that we also know that you said, wow, these were impressive. You know, if, if it's okay with you, Antonio, I'm gonna change that question just a little bit. Um, I, it's really important to me to keep um, my clients kind of confidential, just because I feel like if I, if I trot them out, that's serving me and it's not always serving them. Um, but what I, I can maybe give you a couple of examples of just the, the incredible improvement I've seen. Um, okay. So I'm thinking of one, one client in particular uh, that I've been working with who um, is a, a leader of a you know, multi-billion dollar function in, in his business. It's a, a big global company. Mm -hmm. And when we first started working together, like I said at the beginning, he was incredibly successful. You know, people who get to that level of organizations are usually not um, slackers. They're always brilliant. They, they want to get better. They're hungry to get better. But where he was sort of falling short was um, he wasn't placing enough importance on just something as simple as building relationships with people throughout his organization. And, you know, as we know, the higher you get, the more of a, a, a sort of microscope you're under, right? Our friend Alan Mulally says, when you're the CEO, if you frown, the stock goes down. <laughs> and so I, I've been working with him, you know, over the last year or so to really work on, you know, really simple stuff. I, I, this is not rocket science. What I try to do is give people kind of small homework uh, assignments and work on specific goals and, and just use real life as the practice field, you know? So why don't you take five minutes at the beginning of this next meeting and ask people, something about what they did over the weekend, you know, really, really simple stuff. But if you start to add up 
the sum total of those changes, um, it's really incredible. So, so just as an example, what this client has seen is, I think it was like 90% of his stakeholders, um, all, all the people who could benefit from his improving, said that he had made um, a dramatic improvement in, in that goal of kind of connecting better with people and, and helping them see who he was. And he just recently got his boss's job when his boss was promoted to be the CEO. And I, I, I have full confidence that he will be the CEO someday. So that's just an example of where, you know, I learn so much from my clients mm -hmm. and I'm there, you know, I'm there to guide them, to hold them accountable, to hold up a mirror, to give them some kind of science-based ideas for, for how they can change. But um, it's just so cool to, to be there. It, it reminds me actually of following my mom around when I was little and she was leading yeah. the company. Is I get to watch the coolest things happen and I get to see these amazing improvements. Um, so, so that's just one example. I could, I could probably sit here all day and brag about all the <laughs> brilliant people I get to work with. <laughs> that might be boring after a while, but. No, no, I, I love it because it makes it personal and we can, call, we can relate to ourselves. So it is not bragging at all. Tasha, there's a question from Maria um, Isabel. Maria, can you come with the camera and tell us where you're calling from? Um, hello, Antonio. Unfortunately, my, my computer has not a camera, so okay. I no will problem. be, you know, um, where are you calling from? I am calling from Venezuela, from Caracas, Venezuela. And, um, my question to Tasha is related to the COVID-19. I mm -hmm. perceive that is catalyzing the process to see ourselves as uh, human beings. However, we are, uh, we have been deeply connected to digital devices. Uh, and, um, and now we have been connected to video conference uh, and uh, we are even more connected to these digital devices that we are, uh, practically locked up in our houses. Right. And, uh, and uh, that may create a divorce between your internal awareness and the context surrounding us. So I, I wanted to, to learn uh, from, from you, what is your perspective regarding to this point and how can we improve our self-awareness, because I think that is a key aspect for a servant leader. Thank you for that question, Maria. That is so rich, um, and there's so many elements to that. Um, but one thing I'm going to do before I answer this is give you, I'm going to drop this in the chat, the name of a friend of mine who's an expert and how we deal with technology um, and has been doing a lot of really interesting stuff around technology and COVID. Her name is Amy Blankson. Um, she is actually, if anyone knows Sean Aker, he's a you know, very equally famous person in, in my world, um, but she's his sister. So if, if you're wanting to learn more about this than I might sort of meagerly offer in my answer, she's a great resource. I think what we're seeing um, it, it, it's almost full of contradictions, right? So, so I'll give you the example of something that I'm seeing in my clients is that all of a sudden everyone's working from home and everyone um, knows the intimate details of each other's lives in a new way. You know, my, my husband sometimes will bring our dog and kind of show her before they have their meetings or, you know, you see people's kids running around and especially if you're sharing a small space, you're, you're getting to know the people you work with in, in new and, and I think very cool ways. And there's a lot there that can help you build trust. It can build collaboration. Um, but I agree with you, Maria. I think there's this sort of, you know, I, I even notice it at home at night when my husband and I, you know, <laughs> we've been on Zoom meetings all day and then we're just like this all night. And so I think there's... Uh, Technology isn't inherently good or bad when it comes to connecting with ourselves and others. I really think it's sort of how we use it. And, um, and again, Amy talks about this a lot, but it's being intentional. It's saying, um, how can I, knowing that, you know, 
I have this amazing opportunity to do my job from home, which I might not have had, you know, even 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but how can I be as intentional as possible in, in using it to help me see myself clearly and to build those relationships with others? And, you know, I think that simple act of intentionality can make a big difference. Um, that being said, I know that my, I don't know if you guys have this on your phone, but it tells you the screen time. Every week, it's like your screen time has gone up 50%. And I think, oh my God, you know, so I, I definitely don't have this figured out, but I have seen um, a lot of these elements of kind of, you know, working from home and quarantine be a positive aspect. Um, I don't know. I, I'm curious if anybody has any other comments on that. There's so much to what Maria just said, too. Let me, uh, while people are thinking, Tasha, there is a question from, I don't know if you know, Yuri van Kest. He's watching us through another channel. He's uh, Thinkers 50 as well. He has been there, Singularity University. And mm -hmm. his question is about how did you change your mind in the last few years in your domain and, and why? So how, can, can you tell me the question again? I just want to make sure I'm following. How did you change your mind in the last few years in your domain mm -hmm. and why? Okay. What was? So I learn new information every day that makes me question what I knew and what I was doing before. Um, and, you know, I think having humility as a researcher, as a, an organizational psychologist, as a person is really important. Um, you know, I, I, I could tell you stories about how, you know, all those moments that I realized I wasn't as self-aware as I thought. I could tell you about moments where, you know, oh gosh, I've been doing X with my client all these years and I, I just learned that I should be doing Y. Um, but I'll tell you actually one kind of nuance that um, has, has been important for me as it relates to how I talk about self-awareness with people. Um, you know, the world is so stressful and uncertain. And when I first started kind of talking about self-awareness, I had this almost, um, it wasn't a negative tone, but it was, you're not self-aware, you need to be more self-aware, um, versus, hey, most of us aren't self-aware. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Again, we're all in this together. And if you choose to work on this critical skill, it is going to differentiate you from the pack. It's gonna help you achieve what you want to achieve. It's gonna make everything easier in your life. Um, and, and I just feel like there's something so uh, deep and human about that that you know, there's sort of like the burning platform idea of you know, do this or something bad is gonna happen versus helping people um, grow towards the light. There's a, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with kind of the psychology of abundance, but Kim Cameron at the University of Michigan does a lot of really great work on that. And he talks about something called the heliotropic effect, where if you put a plant in a window um, over time, it actually grows towards the sun. Mm. And, you know, I think as much as we can talk about human development in that context, instead of like fix all the things that are wrong with you versus use your strengths, understand the great things you're doing that you didn't know you were doing before, you know, and, and, and saying what the data are, like I, I shared that statistic about 95% of people think they're self-aware and so on. Um, but, but to frame it in that more positive way, I think it's led to this idea catching on a lot more. Um, so I guess I offer that for each of us in our own lives, you know, how are we trying to advocate for the things that we're the most passionate about? Thank you, Tasha. And Yuri has come in brilliant for the answer. She, he says self-awareness equal eternal struggle to process blind spots in our lives, even accentual Oof. healing. So I think he- I love that. He has his point and, and Yuri has become a DJ now. So he has completely transformed his life. I love this guy. Yuri, thanks for the question. Gerardo, now to Mexico. What's your question? And then I'll go to a question from the Middle East, Rovida. Thank you, Antonio. Hi, Tasha. Gerardo from Puebla, Mexico. Uh, in the last company I used to work for, uh, we used Insight. So it was a big chance, big, big opportunity to use it uh, to get better knowledge of the project teams. Um, but but the, the main issue is that I think we didn't have uh, the appropriate coaching and uh, mm -hmm. mentoring to use it and, and um, to get the most of 
we now know the colors or, or the main color of each person and the main personality and, 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 and their awareness. Again, I was not a, as aware of myself as I thought. <laughs> uh, you're, so, you're not alone. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Uh, but, but the thing is that now I, I, I knew that I was not as aware as I, I was thinking on, uh, but I wanted to improve. So uh, this is two questions. One, what should be the appropriate path after you apply the insight and you have uh, this team that already, I know you are blue, I know you are yellow, I know mm. you are green. Yes, but, and then? So it, it, what should be the appropriate path once you have all this information to guide this team to really get the most out of this information? Mm -hmm. And the second one is that um, I had a big discussion with these people that were applying this because uh, after a couple of years, I told them, hey guys, I don't know if I have improved or not, but two, two years ago, I knew I was not as aware as I wanted to be of myself, but I think I have done things to improve. So can you make me again the exam so I can, I can know if I have improved? And they told me, no, that's useless. You, you are what you are. You don't change. You have to have only a big break point in your life can change you and you will not change color or that. Guys, maybe I will not change color, but I want to know if I'm more self-aware of myself or not, interior and exterior. And they told me, no, 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 that don't change. It has to pass like five, 10 years for that to happen. So I would like from you to understand first that part of, of what should be the, the right path to follow after the team has this information and how can we get the most. And the second one, I'm pretty sure that there's a way to measure if you get more self-aware after some time. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I, there's so much to that, Geraldo. Um, let me think. <laughs> Okay, let me start with the second piece because what you just said is so, so important. And it's something that I think uh, what our research has found goes against common wisdom. So you have all those people that are saying, oh, you can't change. And you know, it, it takes something really big and life-changing to, to fundamentally alter your self-awareness or self-knowledge. And we have actually found that that's not true. Um, we looked at all of the different types of situations that cause people to increase their self-awareness. And we basically found three overall um, types of scenarios that can increase our self-knowledge if we have the right approach. So one um, is, is what we, we named earthquake events, right? These are kind of what your, what your colleagues are saying, these life-changing things. You know, I got fired right. from my job without knowing why. Or, you know, my, my spouse left me overnight and I had no idea there was anything wrong with our relationship. You know, these kind of huge life-changing things. Um, and, and yes, do those change us? Of course. Um, do they have to change us? No. Sometimes people persist in their um, unawareness mm -hmm. throughout those events. But what's really interesting is the two other types of events we discovered are really a lot smaller um, and a lot more incremental. So the second was, we, we called it new roles and new rules. And that is basically any type of situation that's new for us. We start a new job, uh, a new relationship. Uh, you know, we're, we're 18 years old and we have our first year at university. Um, these things where we're placed in new situations that give us a chance to learn about ourselves. Um, so those are absolutely um, uh, opportunities for us to see ourselves more clearly. But the third type of event I wanted to, to point out, I think given what I'm hearing you say, is something we named everyday insights. And this is something, you know, our research subjects would tell us, you know, someone said something kind of under their breath at a meeting about me. And I, you know, it was such a small comment, but I couldn't get it out of my head. And, and it made me realize that X, Y, Z, right? And so what was fascinating was when, when we asked people which of those three types of events had changed them the most, they, they named that third category, the everyday insight, at a significant rate, right? I, I actually can't remember off the top of my head. It was either three to one or two to one. But the point was these everyday insights were, by and large, um, the most common 
ways that people saw themselves more clearly. So if, if you want to go back to your colleagues and say, science says you're wrong, I will leave you to do that. <laughs> but I, 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 you are correct. Your hunch is something that we've supported as well. Um, and people can change. You know, Antonio and Ron's and, yes. and Oleg's and my mutual friend, Marshall Goldsmith, um, he says, um, can people change? Absolutely. Will people change? Maybe. <laughs> right, and it's because we really have to work at it. Um, but but absolutely, yes. we can see ourselves more clearly. We can change. Going back to the part about teams, um, you're bringing up a really important point, which is there's sort of two levels of analysis if you're using you know a resource like Insight to help um, move your team forward. So there's two things I'd encourage you to think about. One is at the individual level. Something as simple as having each person, you know, in the next opportunity you have to talk about this, say, here's one thing that I've learned about myself and one thing that I'm going to do differently moving forward. And the one thing ideally would be something that your team could help hold you accountable to. You know, an example would be, um, I read Insight and I got some feedback and I realized that I interrupt people a lot more than I want to. And my one commitment is I'm going to do a better job of not interrupting people. And I'm actually going to ask you in our next team meeting, if I do that, to <laughs> do a timeout or to say, stop, stop, you just did it, right? So, so kind of engaging each other in positive behavioral change. The second thing to think about is to look at team self-awareness. And there's a chapter in Insight where I talk about, you know, a lot of our mutual friends and mentor, Alan Mulally, and what he did at Ford. Um, and there are a couple of resources where um, there's a team self-awareness assessment, and then there's a couple of exercises that I give that can kind of help you take those conversations from the individual level to the team level. And what I've found in the consulting I do on that is sometimes that's almost an easier conversation to have because it's looking at the interdependencies, um, right? So, so I think both are important, but those would be sort of two things I would offer. Um, there is one thing, Antonio, I, 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 we talked about this very briefly a while ago, but we just launched a, a brand new online course for Insight. Yeah. Um, and my team actually put together a discount code for you guys. So um, this isn't a hard sell. It's more just if you, if you want any other resources. I'm going to type in the chat the um, website for that. And then Project Economy 20 is your special discount code. I think it's like a 33% discount or something. So that could potentially be another way to continue this work. Um, and there's, you know, even in the appendix of Insight, there's the team self-awareness assessment and kind of a lot of things that can get you started there. Thank you, Tasha. And we're, we're going to share much. this uh, when we share the recording to, to the 450 uh, colleagues here in the group. Um, can I just squeeze one more question? I had said, uh, Rovaida, uh, you want to come up on screen, please? Or just put your question. Sorry, uh, there's a few more questions, but we not have time. I will try to get them answered afterwards. Rovaida, if you're still there. Nope, oh, there she is. Yeah. What's your question? Where are you calling from? Uh, hi, how are you? Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm calling from Bahrain uh, in Asia. I don't know if you... We know. Aware. Okay. <laughs> um, my question was, the. Uh, I think it is somehow uh, answered through all the questions before, how to engage the team uh, from the beginning, especially uh, when they are not... Uh, knowing each other before or uh, uh, it's a new project and uh, we need all of them to be engaged in the right way. Um, uh, I have another thing uh, regarding uh, the, the, the say that uh, walk the talk or be what you say or um, uh, there are so many phrases uh, to, trying to uh, press on that. Uh, as a salesman, do you have to really believe in what you are selling? As a leader, do you have really to believe in everything you are breaching? Uh, for for example, it's not real. Uh, let's say Steve Jobs, he, he did not give any of the Apple uh, 
products to his kids, he, he just sell it to people. Is this something related or not related to self-awareness and uh, self-absorption? Is there any relation uh, with this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I love that question. So there's a lot of research on this, actually. Um, and, and I'm going to make this parallel, and hopefully it'll make sense why I'm making it. But um, there's been research done on something called emotional labor, which is basically, um, you know, let's say you work in a job in customer service, and you're having a really bad day, but you have to act happy. You know, you're, you're working at a Disney theme park, and you have to be a pretty princess, even though, uh, you know, something terrible is happening in your personal life. And what researchers have found is that jobs that require a lot of emotional labor um, tend to erode our well-being. They're stressful. They make us feel kind of less meaning and less accomplishment. And so my perspective on self-awareness as it relates to your question, um, Roita, is that ideally we are doing things we believe in, right? Because if we're self-aware, we understand our principles. We understand our passions. We understand What's the, you know, Steve Jobs, what's the dent I want to make in the universe? Um, but theoretically, we could be doing things that we don't believe in, right? And that's where I think it starts to, to fall apart. And so in an ideal world, a self-aware person isn't just aware of what they believe in. They're designing their work and their career and the way they spend their time to advance those things. Um, you know, so for me personally, my number one value is to make a positive difference. And what I try to do is, is instill that in everything I do. Am I perfect at it? No. But if I'm asking myself that question, you know, if my, my most important goal is to make a positive difference, how can I wake up today and do that? You know, I, I'm not going to do it by advocating for something that I don't believe is going to make a positive difference, as an example. That's why I will never go into politics <laughs> for that exact reason. Is, um, you know, it's just, I think there's a lot of people that are cut out for it. I am not personally one of them. I want a life of coherence, right? And being able to do the things that are the most important to me. So um, the short answer is absolutely, I think they're related. And thank you so much for bringing that up. That's a great thought. Um, thank you, Tasha. I'll throw two quick questions. Maybe you can answer. Um, uh, uh, one from Susanne is, what does the fact that you appear to organize your books by color say about you? <laughs> and the second from our good friend, Mark, uh, how about kids' self-awareness? So just briefly, and we'll try to finish in two minutes. Sure. I, I saw Lourdes's comment about the wrinkle cream that I use. Oh, yeah. It's called Touch Up My Appearance on Zoom. There's an there's a option that you can pick in the settings where it says Touch Up My Appearance. I would highly recommend it. Um, <laughs> but thank you for that question. So what does it say about me that I organize my books this way? Here's an interesting data point. Before the pandemic, my bookshelf did not look like this. Um, but once we, you know, it was clear that we were going to be in lockdown here in the U.S. and throughout the world for a long time, um, I decided that I wanted to create a space where I could show up um, virtually in a way that, you know, was sort of consistent with my brands and yada, yada, yada. But I think deep down, I really just needed to control something that week. <laughs> and so I, you know, I sort of took everything down and every time I walk by this, we, we've got a loft and it's very open so I can kind of see my office from everywhere I am. It just reduces my anxiety a little bit. So I, I am very organized. My closet looks very similarly. So um, take whatever you will <laughs> from that. Um, and then the second question, Antonio, can you remind me what that was? Well, it's maybe difficult, but Mark is well, our fan of kids, education, children. Oh, right. Yes, thank you. Awareness at which age? So there's a lot to this. Um, I actually, the only child I have is my five pound poodle, um, but there is a ton of research on this exact topic. I talk about the, the development of self-awareness. I talk about that in Insight. There are kind of key stages of development as they relate to self-awareness in childhood and adolescence. Um, but I'll leave you guys with one thing to think about. How many of you have kids? Raise your hand. Okay, raise, keep your hand up if you want to raise um, modest, non-narcissistic children. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so this is for you. So there is one study that showed that parents who focus on emphasizing warmth to their children, right, sort of love and warmth, um, tend to raise 
more mature, less narcissistic children than parents who emphasize how special their kids are. So the example would be specialness is you are the smartest kid in the class, you're the best, you're the most important, versus warmth, which is I love you, I value you, you are so important to me and to our family and to your friends. Um, and I, what I like about that is it's very um, practical, right? You can say the statement I just made to my child, is it focusing on warmth versus specialness? And in some total, that will help um, with that goal. Thank you. Very nice way to finish. Wonderful, Tasha. We could have gone on for hours to listening to you. This is great. It's so Thank you guys for your questions. Connecting the world with somebody like you. And uh, now you have a big group of fans, more fans. Um, thank you, Tasha. Really appreciate <laughs> taking the time for us. And uh, uh, we'll make sure everybody gets the information and the discount and the, everything. And uh, yeah, Wonderful. thank you. Thank you from behalf thank of Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next Thank Thursday. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Antonio. See you, guys. Thank Bye. you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Antonio. Bye. Ciao. Thank you, Thank you, Cuídense. Bye.